Good morning, and welcome everyone to our uh, third quarter presentation. And welcome to our Q3 presentation. I want to start this presentation with repeating the value creation strategy we presented a month ago at our Capital Markets Day. One was to become a leading Nordic telco. This means growing core connectivity and services and focus on margin expansion um, through modernization. Two, a strong Asian entity operating more independently from the rest of the group. A cash flow focused Asia, realizing synergies in two merged entities and drive operational uh, performance. Three, a leading Nordic infrastructure company. Our focus will be to develop and monetize our infrastructure. And four, a new and focused approach to develop our adjacent businesses. We want to develop some of the assets that we already have, and we want to uh, unlock the value of assets through transactions and partnerships. Let me then go through this quarter's result. As you can see from these highlights, we have already started to execute on our reshape Telenor strategic agenda. In the quarter, Telenor continued to deliver uh, uh, service revenue growth, and I'm especially pleased with the Nordic mobile growth of more than 4%. I believe this is a strong support uh, for our profitable growth ambition in the Nordics. As we have said, we currently have a significant cost headwind from energy, especially in Norway, Denmark, and in Pakistan. The impact this quarter in the third quarter and will continue to constitute a headwind for us until we start receiving energy from the PPAs that we have entered into for Norway and Denmark. These two PPAs have a significant lower price than the current spot price uh, that we currently see. In Norway, these arrangements will start coming into effect in the fourth quarter next year and in Denmark late the year after. In a quarter, we executed on the first step of crystallizing value in our infrastructure business, with signing an agreement to sell 30% of our fiber company in Norway. With this transaction, we can increase the fiber rollout in Norway. Shareholders will benefit through a share buyback program, and in addition, we will strengthen uh, our balance sheet. Another key part of the value creation strategy is the two big mergers in Asia. In the quarter, we have received regulatory clearance in Malaysia. As expected, it took some time, and we will now move on with the final approval from the stock exchange and our shareholders. As we have said, I expect, I expect this transaction to close in the fourth quarter and we are well prepared to start realizing the synergies. In Thailand, we yesterday received a regulatory notification. As presented, some of the remedies needs clarification, and we will now seek to engage in a dialogue with the regulator to seek further clarifications. Let me then uh, turn to the Nordic business. At the Capital Markets Day, we told you that we believe in growth in the Nordics. And I'm quite pleased to see that in the third quarter uh, it's supporting this ambition with an overall growth across the portfolio. The growth is driven by two trends. First, a focus on core connectivity in all the segments, both mobile and fixed. Second, by growing services beyond connectivity. Security is such a product for both the consumer segment and the business segment. In these services, uh, in Norway, these services currently accounts for 18% of the mobile revenues, with a growth this quarter of 12%. A key element in our strategy is to develop these services together with partners, then to sell it to our customers using our brand and distribution strength. By providing more value to our customers, we have during the quarter done price increases in all our Nordic markets. We have done this selectively across our customer segments, and we see the effect of this starting to come true now. Some of these increases are lifting the price on existing price plans, some is for new sale, and some are related to new offerings and new services. 
Let me then deep dive uh, into Norway. In Norway, and as you can see on this slide, we see growth in what we call the legacy-free service revenues. In the quarter, this uh, revenues grew with 3.1%. And as mentioned, we have a headwind related to the high energy prices. But adjusted for that, and also adjusted for the copper decommission, we see the top-line growth resulting in an underlying EBITDA growth of 2.3%. Going forward, this is not enough. As we, started, uh, as we stated at the Capital Markets Day, our ambition is to deliver EBITDA growth uh, of mid-single digit, based on an OPEX reduction in the Nordic uh, of 1-3%. to For the years to come, this means that we in Norway and also in the other uh, Nordic markets expect EBITDA to grow faster than our revenues. To succeed with our ambition on profitable growth, I have a special attention to a continued modernization of our business in Norway. With the copper shutdown now coming to an end, we see a potential for additions, additional simplification and modernization in Norway. New modernization initiatives are being implemented to improve operational efficiencies and customer experiences with positive impact on the OPEC level in 2023 and the following years. Our plan is that this will be an important contributor to the EBITDA growth in Norway in 2023. Our new Nordic setup is also expected to contribute to modernization and operational efficiencies in both the support functions and as well in the area of technology and IT. We will come back with more information about the plans we have in this area in our Q4 presentation. Moving to Asia. In Asia, we are progressing with the structural transactions in Malaysia and in Thailand. We have received regulatory clearance from the Malaysian regulator and also the Security Commission approval for the proposed merger. We will now soon reach out to our shareholders for an EGM approval and aim for this transaction to close within this quarter, the fourth quarter. In Thailand, as I said, we just received the notification letter from the regulator. Initially, and as presented, some of the revenues need more clarifications. We will therefore now seek to engage with the regulator to discuss the remedies and seek further clarity. Going to Bangladesh and Pakistan, organically we see a good development continue in Bangladesh with a 7% revenue growth from increased data usage and demand. This is coming from uh, existing customers because the SIM band has not made it possible for us to take a fair share of the new customer growth in uh, the, the, the previous month. However, we have now reached an agreement with the regulator such that we can start using recircled, uh, recircled numbers to get back also with our SIM sale. In Pakistan, the demanding situa flooding situation has impacted people's life and economy, as well as continued increase in energy prices and high inflation. This is impacting our revenue growth, and of course also significantly increasing the OPEX. As I mentioned in our Q2 presentation, we have started a strategic review in Pakistan, and I expect more clarity on our structural alter alternatives in the coming months. At our Capital Markets Day, we said that we want to focus on synergies and cash flow uh, in Asia. With a target of an accumulated uh, free cash flow of 12 billion in the period uh, up to 2025, we will shortly start reporting on cash flow generation from our Asian businesses. Turning to uh, infrastructure. When it comes to infrastructure, we are executing on the strategy we presented uh, a month ago. The fiber deal in Norway support continued high fiber rollout while crystallizing some of the significant values we see in the infrastructure portfolio. Following several years of high investments in the Norwegian fiber market, the transaction demonstrates the value of Telenor's fiber and the infrastructure assets that we have. The deal 
allows us to strengthen Telenor's competitive position in Norway as the transaction enables Telenor to accelerate our uh, FTTH rollout and also the uh, HFC uh, replacement. We are bringing in strong investors with a long-term horizon. We have been able to attract new capital on a very compelling uh, term and wider benefits of partnership with an experienced infrastructure investor. The cash proceeds will partly be used on fiber investments, partly distributed through our uh, share buyback program, and partly to strengthen our balance sheet and our financial position. And as you can see on this slide, the intention uh, is to call for an EGM to initiate, initiate a share buyback uh, program shortly after closing of this transaction. From October 1st, Janneke Hilland is the new head of our infrastructure business area. She will have a special attention uh, to develop the organic development of the tower companies across the Nordics. This will also include the future structural tower opportunities that we see. In addition, she will continue the work on creating a data center strategy. The last four business era, uh, it's uh, on the adjacent business. As a part of the Recep Telenor we presented uh, at our Capital Markets Day, we launched this new business area headed by Dam, which will focus on uh, our adjacent businesses. We have decided to name this area Telenor AMP. This quarter, we delivered a double-digit revenue and double-digit EBITDA growth from the consolidated units, driven by strong development in connection, Telenor links, and Telenor maritime. We also got confirmation on our advanced position when it comes to IoT, as Telenor is ranked among the top three IoT players in, Nor in Europe. This makes us a clear IoT market leader here in the Nordics. Going forward, our focus will be on two areas. One, a strategic review of the portfolio that we have, where we will look for partnerships, monetization, and possible exit. And two, continue to develop uh, ourselves into a leading Nordic positions when it comes to IoT and security. Let me end uh, with this slide. This was uh, a slide we also used a month ago at the Capital Markets Day. And it shows our financial priorities in the months and quarters and years to come. One, profitable growth, reducing CapEx intensity and continued modernization in the Nordics. Two, strengthen cash flow from Asia. Three, unlock value from our infrastructure. And four, a disciplined approach in uh, our adjacent businesses. And with that, let me welcome our CFO, Tone, on the stage. Thank you, Sigve, and good morning, everyone. <clears throat> The strategy we presented at the CMD in September sets out a new direction for Telnor with profitable growth as one of the key elements. I'm therefore particularly pleased to see that we this quarter are able to generate 4% growth in mobile service revenues in the Nordics. And this is a key driver for the overall 2.5% organic growth in service revenue. Organic EBITDA also increased by 2.5%, although with many items impacting the results both negatively and positively. As outlined on the CMD, we have seen increasing energy prices, and as Sigve said, especially in Norway, Denmark, and Pakistan. For the quarter, however, the energy increase was more than compensated by a reversal of an accrual in Pakistan related to SIM tax. This amounted to 600 million. Free cash flow came in at 5 billion or 4 billion, excluding M&A, in line with our expectations. Let us start with taking a closer look at revenues. As you can see, we show growth across the Nordics, including mobile and fixed future in Norway. This is driven by increased usage and partly price increases implemented during the year. Norway delivers 3% growth on non-legacy and a mobile ARPU growth of also 3%. We also saw solid development in Bangladesh, delivering growth of 7% despite the SIM ban. The reported growth for Pakistan is supported, as, as reported, is supported 
by the SIMTAX reversal, excluding this effect, the growth is negative 3%. Looking at the other segment, we see double-digit growth in Telenor Connection, our IoT company. On the negative side, we still see copper headwinds, which will gradually taper off now as we enter 2023. Thailand and Malaysia shown also negative growth, and this is reflecting the prevailing macro and competitive sentiments in this market. Moving to OPEX, this quarter we see a 6% increase or a 500 million knock up from the third quarter 2021. This mainly reflects around 200 million higher energy costs. It is a little over 100 in increased sales and marketing spend, as we've talked about throughout the year, particularly then in Bangladesh and Sweden. And we still have around 100 related to strategic projects, which we then will expect gradually to be reduced going forward. Apart from these items, we see only modest cost increases. And this goes to that the structural initiatives we are running currently have the ability to mitigate the inflationary pressures we have seen so far. Moving to energy. At the CMD, we highlighted that the sharp increase in energy prices increased the uncertainty around our EBITDA guidance. As we all experience, the situation remains very volatile. And even though we see spot prices have come somewhat down in the very, very near term, we base our estimates on forward prices and the other estimates we can have in the markets. And based on this, we still see the second half outlook in line with what we presented a year ago at the CMD of a 2.5 billion of cost in the second half of the year. And based on the mid-October forward price that we see it, we estimate the EBITDA headwind for the full year coming from energy to be around three percentage points for the full year. As showed on this graph, the main drivers for the increase are Norway, Pakistan and Denmark, as we have talked about this year. And then, as Sigva also said, the 10-year PPA agreements that will come into effect late 23 or early 24 in Norway or, and late 24 in Denmark have prices which are much more in line with the historical averages we've seen for energy prices. Moving to EBITDA. We report a 2.5% EBITDA growth for the quarter. And as I said, it includes both negative special items and the significant reversal of the SIM tax accrual in Pakistan. This reversal of the previous provisions are done line by line on the same accounting lines as when we did the accruals. Looking at the performance in the Nordics, we see strong growth in EBITDA in Sweden, there is also a solid reported number for Finland, and this is, as you remember, based on the negative one-off in the same quarter last year. The decrease in Denmark is fully explained by increased energy cost, while in Norway, as Sigve also talked about, it is a combination of the copper headwind and energy cost, which is resulting in a material decrease of 9%. I would also just make you aware and draw your attention to that there is a change in periodization this quarter between Telnor Infra, which is in the other segment, and Telnor Norway, which is removing a time lag of booking of energy costs between the, the two entities of two months. Uh, and the result this quarter is an increasing revenue of Infra of around 100 million and a similar increase in Norway of COGS of around 100. There is no major impact on the group figures for this internal periodization. In Asia, we see solid growth in revenues in Bangladesh, which follows through to EBITDA. In Pakistan, however, the underlying EBITDA decreased by 22%, which is driven by the energy cost, the FX headwinds, and we also see some negative impact from the flooding on the top line. During this year, we have talked about these three special items impacting us negatively throughout the year, and you see here in this figure to, to the right here that they impact in total around six percentage points on EBITDA this quarter. Then, the, on the other hand, the reversal of the accruals had a positive impact of 4.8% for the quarter. 
The net income to equity holders of Telnor ended at 1.5 billion. The reduction from last year is primarily a result of FX effects, which comes from strengthening of the US dollar and Singapore dollar versus the Norwegian kroner. These effects are, as you know, they are unrealized and non-cash items. In total, FX has a negative contribution of 2.4 billion. Lower profit before tax this year also results in a 400 million lower tax expense in the quarter. CapEx for the quarter is in line with plan and primarily driven by the 5G rollout in the Nordics, the fiber investments in Norway, and the network investments in Thailand. Free cash flow improved in the third quarter and came in, according to our expectations, at 5.2 billion or 4 billion, excluding M&A. Year to date, the free cash flow stands at 9.7 billion. During the quarter, we have seen a positive development of 0.1 on our leverage, which is driven by the cash flow generation, which is then on the other side partly offset by the currency impact on net debt of around 3 billion Norwegian kroner. Then I will move to the outlook for the year. The service revenue growth is progressing according to our plan, and we maintain the expectation of low single-digit organic growth. On our Capital Markets Day, we highlighted that the energy prices have increased significantly in the second half of the year and created an additional headwind on the full-year EBITDA compared to what we saw of 1.5%. However, as we talked about this quarter, we have a positive one-time effect in Pakistan, which compensate for the increasing energy cost. As a consequence, we maintain the outlook for 2022 organic EBITDA around last year's level. The capex to sales is still expected to be in the range of 16 to 17%. Then Sigve, I believe we're ready for the Q&A. Yep, yeah, we are. Operator, may we have the first question, please? Sure, we will take the first question from line Andrew Lee from Goldman Sachs. The line is open now, please go ahead. Yeah, good morning. I, I had two questions. Um, first one is just on your um, energy cost uh, headwind visibility into 2023. Um, could you just talk about, to us about how much visibility you have um, on, on, on that headwind? And you talked about your confidence in mitigating the headwinds for 2022, but how confident are you to mitigate for 2023? Um, and then the second question was on a really interesting deal uh, uh, to sell 30% of your fiber asset, uh, as you laid out on one of the slides. Just wondered, is that the extent uh, of, uh, of your pl plans to sell that asset? Could you sell, sell 49% or do you ever give up um, your strategic control of that asset? Thank you. Yes, I can start with energy. Uh, as you know, uh, we have a long-term hedge in place for uh, the Norwegian energy consumption, but that comes into effect towards the end of 2023. So for 2023, until that comes into effect, we, we don't have a hedge in Norway. In Sweden, uh, we have approximately 50% hedged uh, for 2023 consumption. In Finland, uh, the pricing mechanisms leave us to be around two-thirds of the consumption being hedged, as it is a three-year rolling pricing mechanism there. And then Denmark is also waiting for the long hedge of energy prices. So we, uh, we, we have the volatile situation on the energy in general, and we will continue to be exposed in those Nordic markets. In Asia, as you know, it's, it's a different dynamics and, and uh, it's difficult to hedge it based on diesel and other components. And the PPAs will start ticking in then in the fourth quarter next year for Norway. Yeah. With a significant lower price. Now on the second question, uh, what we have said all along is that uh, we want to sell, bring in a minority partner in our fiber infrastructure in Norway, and that's exactly what we have done. We're very happy uh, with the uh, evaluation we got out of that, uh, and uh, as I also talked about them in the pre presentation. We will now use some of the proceeds to continue to grab market share on fiber in Norway uh, and, uh, and also some of it then to pay back to our shareholders. So we are happy with the 30% minority position that they have. There is no plans uh, uh, above that. 
Thank you. Can I just um, thank you. That's very really helpful. Can I just follow up on the um, on the energy side? Obviously, your ARPU trends are uh, uh, pretty decent this this quarter. How comp confident are you in your ability to mitigate or at least partially mitigate the, um, the energy headwinds in 2023? You know, accepting that it's clearly a volatile situation. Yeah. If uh, so your question is about uh, how, if the pricing power that we have was that the question? It, Exactly, yeah, the ability to mitigate the, uh, the cost headwinds or pass through the cost headwinds onto your customers. Yeah, we are not going to give any, any views on what we plan to do on that going forward. Uh, but what we have done in the last few months is to do price increases in all our Nordic markets. Uh, and uh, we do that in various ways. Uh, and we see that... Uh, most of this is actually related to giving customers more, also more services. Uh, so it's appreciated by our customers. That is what we have done, uh, and um, that is now starting to come true. Most of these increases uh, we have done quite quite late, lately. So, so it first in the coming month you will see this coming true. I don't want to give any more views than that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We will take the next question from the line. Maurice Patrick from Barclays. The line is open now. Please go ahead. Good morning, guys. <clears throat> Thanks for taking the question. Um, just a question on the timing and phasing of the Norway EBITDA turnaround. So, you, I mean, you delivered <coughs> minus 8.8%, I think, this quarter, and you talked about the four percentage points from energy and the wholesale drag. In the past, you know, you've communicated the, the sort of the idea that the, the drag from the wholesale gradually decreases as we get into 2023. I think it kind of laps in the second half, and you've got the PPA coming in, as you say, in the fourth quarter. I think you said, Sika, in the prepared remarks, you expect to grow Norway EBITDA in 2023. But if you give us some sort of, some sort of sense of, sort of the phasing of that, that would be very helpful. Like, you know, is it for the full year? Will it just be in the fourth quarter? Um, will the first half likely be similar to what we've seen this quarter? That would be helpful. Thank you. You want to start? No, you can start. Yeah, okay. No, uh, I think uh, it is pretty much as you said. Uh, the um, headwind from the uh, legacy uh, decline will continue into the first two quarters of next year. Uh, the second half of next year, uh, this will then, on a year-by-year, a year-on-year basis, be more or less washed out. Uh, and then, as I also said, we uh, are now initiating new initiatives, efficiency initiatives and modernization initiatives to bring down uh, the cost of, of the uh, rest of the business. Uh, and uh, that is going to impact our EBITDA for next year. But I don't want to give you any more guiding than, than uh, what I did in my presentation and what I just said now. That's great. Um, thank you very much, Anita. Thank you. We will take the next question from line. Andreas Jill from Benspec. The line is open now. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, just a follow-up to uh, Andrew's question. Uh, as you said, you have done some price increases as of late. Just curious about your learnings from those increases, uh, and also if you can see any changes in consumer behavior, uh, given where we are in terms of macro. And then maybe also on Thailand, if you could say anything about these uh, proposed remedies, uh, if they are as you expected, although I understand you need clarity on some of them, but is it fairly as you expected? Thanks. Yeah, start with the, the, the price question. Uh, I think the, uh, the customers are appreciating uh, more for more. <laughs> Uh, and many of these increase, uh, increase, price increases are actually related to giving more for more. Uh, and we don't see any major effect uh, uh, with our customers on that. In the price-sensitive segments, which is around 30%, I think, uh, of our Norwegian customer base, of course, there we are more careful. Uh, but for the more, the, uh, more high-end customers, we see that, uh, that uh, the price increases has been accepted, if I can use that word. Uh, the same we see across uh, the other Nordic markets. However, we don't know how this is going to develop, how competition is going to react to this. Uh, so, so, so that's yet to be seen. But so far, so good, I will say, on that question. On Thailand, um, 
Well, some of the elements that we have seen in, in the notification we got is as expected. Some of them uh, are uh, uh, unclear for us what it really means. Uh, and that's why uh, we need to seek uh, further clarifications, uh, what, what it really means in practice. Uh, so it's, a, uh, it's the, the letter we got on several elements are actually quite unclear when it comes to how, how this will be oper uh, op uh, operationalized. So that's, that's what, why we need to go back uh, to the regulator. But as we have said all along, the regulator is not, do not have the authority to say yes or no. Uh, they only have the uh, mandate to look at remedies. So the notification uh, shows us that we were right on that. This, the, the, the regulator the, do not say yes or no, uh, but they, they look at remedies. So at least that, that is, uh, and it has been a lot of discussion around that, can the regulator actually say no? Uh, so this confirmed, uh, the notification letter confirms that, uh, that uh, our understanding has been right. So I, I don't, I'm not able to answer more in detail than that. Now we will sit down and, and discuss this and, and seek that clarification. Very good. Thanks. Thank you. We will take the next question from the line. Peter Nelson from EBG. The line is open now. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I guess, uh, Sigve, you've commented as much as you, you want to on the uh, on the OPEX impact in the coming quarters in Norway. So I'll just stick to Nordic mobile revenues <clears throat> um, are obviously quite strong. Uh, and as you mentioned, Sigve, you've, you've raised prices. Um, would you say you have uh, – you, could you discuss a bit how – what, what kind of support you are seeing from from the launch of 5G? Is that a factor here in enabling you to to increase prices, upsetting, etc., or is it still too early? And um, are you seeing any more sort of concrete uh, discussions and and perhaps contracts with with um, with enterprises on uh, on 5G in in I guess across the Nordic markets? Thank you. Yeah, some of this is related to upsell uh, the, uh, from 4 to 5G. Uh, we do that in Norway and we do that in Finland, and there is still a room to grow on that. So, yes. Uh, then we see that the fixed wireless is now picking up uh, based on uh, our 5G uh, network, and we see now that that, that has actually cr increased quite a lot over the last few months. Then on your, your business segment, uh, we see now that we have more and more dialogues with um, customers on building 5G networks that we see uh, both here, uh, but also in, in Finland and also coming in Sweden. Uh, um, but that's a, still a little bit too early to say how big that effect will be. But there is more demand now than what we have seen in the past on, on those uh, 5G-related uh, uh, private networks. Yeah, I think you, you, thank you. you commented earlier on, on sort of what you're seeing on the consumer market. Are you seeing any pullback of, of any kind um, on, on the enterprise side in, in relation to sort of the weakening macro outlook? No. It, it, that's probably also still too early. No, we haven't seen that in the Nordics. Uh, no, not at all, I will say. Okay, thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question or make a contribution on today's call, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star 2. Thank you. We will take the next question from line Frank from DNB. The line is open now. Please go on. Yes, hello, and uh, thank you for taking the question. Uh, my question is more on uh, on the cost development in in Norway. Um, um, so uh, it was a bit on the weak side of consensus expectations, and uh, it, it's um, it, you, you have talked about the energy impact and and uh, and so on. But um, is there any any, any short term um, cost measures you are pursuing in Norway? Um, more in the more in the short term to um, to mitigate the um, the, the, the cost um, headwinds from uh, energy and uh, and also more in general really. Um, well, that's that's my question yeah. really. Well, Frank, that depends what you mean by short term. <laughs> Uh, as, as I said, uh, we, we are investing now in taking this service position. And as I said, 18% of the mobile revenues in Norway now are coming from those services on top of the data connectivity. 
so we, we are uh, hiring uh, people on that area, and we are investing into that. So that's part of the, the answer. Um, uh, when it comes to then going forward, we have now embarked on, on a new program to look at, and this is coming out from now, the copper decommissioning pro uh, program ending, then we have resources enough to look at what else can we, can we modernize uh, and make more efficient in Norway. And those initiatives uh, we plan then to take now with us into 2023. And as I said in my presentation, that will be a, a main driver to, to have the EBITDA development in Norway next year. So yes, if, if you mean short, time, short term is the next two, three quarters, yes, we have initiatives to, to address the rest of the cost base. Thank you. And uh, a follow-up on, on the price learnings, uh, the price responses that you've basically um, seen or not seen in the Nordics based on your, uh, your um, um, recent price increases. We've seen, we've seen Telia, for instance, uh, increasing some fixed line prices in Norway, but on the, on the mobile side, have you, have you seen anything here or uh, in, in other markets that competitors have, have followed up? Yeah, I, I just want to stay very uh, careful on the pricing discussion when it comes to our competitors. I, I can say what we have done, and I can say what, how we have uh, uh, seen the development or, or the way our customers have taken this, but I don't want to go into what the competitors are doing or thinking or will do. Thank you. Thank you. We will take the next question from the line. Louis from Credit Suisse. The line is open now. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, I have three questions, please. Uh, the first one is on, on Sweden and Finland. Uh, we have seen a pretty strong acceleration in terms of service revenues and also on ABDA. Uh, can you give us some color on the drivers uh, on both countries, please? And how sustainable do you think this can be going forward? The second one would be around the Thailand uh, remedies. Uh, you are saying that there are some remedies that need further clarification. It would be helpful if you can give us some color on which of the remedies are the ones that are causing a major concern on your end. And the third one on wages renegotiations in 2023. We have heard uh, some comments from your competitors on wages expectations into 2023. Uh, it would be helpful to understand how these negotiations are going and any visibility you can, you can give us by country would be helpful. Thanks. You can yeah. pick which one you want to take. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I start with, uh, with Sweden and Finland. Um, we are very pleased with the performance we see in Sweden now. We have for several quarters uh, going back, we have talked about the turnaround we were working on. We were talking about how we were preparing ourselves through our systems and way of work. And we are very pleased now to see that we compete much better in the Swedish market. And this is really what you see uh, in the results uh, going forward. So we have a solid top line growth in, in Sweden. And that is then, as you see, f following through to the EBITDA. Uh, in Finland, we continue to, to do the 5G upselling, and, and we believe still that the Finnish market is a very healthy market when it comes to, to how the customers are embarking on higher price plans, uh, building up on the, on the, the improved uh, data usage and, and uh, the upgrade from 4 to 5G. So, so we will continue to work on this at the same time as we, of course, continue to focus on taking out these cross-Nordic synergies that we will now uh, have a focus on following the, the establishment of the Nordic uh, unit, and we are looking across. And that is both coming to support the top line over time, but also work on the efficiency in the cost base. When it comes to wages for 2023, uh, these are market-by-market market, uh, agreements, as you know, we have been in the past able to mitigate the price increases, salary increases by efficiencies, as you see. You see it this quarter as well. 
that we, we have a very slight increase in, in, in the salaries and wages, and we will continue to focus on this going forward. Then, of course, it remains how the overall macro and, and these agreements will play out in 2023. But we have had good learnings, and we will continue to, to uh, focus on this. And then you can yeah, just yeah. <coughs> if you look back the few last few years, Tona, I think we have taken down the number of employees in the range of eight, seven, eight percent. To, to uh, uh, I'm not saying that that's what we're going to do going forward, but that that's the way we have been balancing the the personnel costs. Mm. Now on Thailand, um, well, take two two of the areas that we need to understand better. One, it's. Uh, uh, what they say about price adjustments or tariff adjustments, we need to understand that. Another one is what they say about uh, uh, creating capacity in network to, um, to facilitate uh, uh, MVNOs. Those are two, two examples of things we need more clarity on. But, but there are more in, in, in the document that we have received. That's helpful, thanks. Thank you. We will take the next question from line Francesca for BNB Paris. The line is open now. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks very much for taking questions. I've just got um, two, please. On Bangladesh, um, you've obviously said that there's a, a partial resolution to you, reuse SIM cards. Um, do you have any update on any how that's progressing and any, uh, any expectation that you'll actually be able to reissue numbers? And then secondly, please, just on Norway fiber. Um, so it looks like your fiber net ads are slowing slightly. Um, so earlier in the year, you explained that net ads were expected to pick up in the second half of the year. Can you just please explain the trends that you're seeing and if this is still the case? Thank you. Yeah, I can answer Bangladesh and then you take the fiber. Mm. Uh, uh, was your question on Bangladesh on this SIM ban? Was that a question? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And any update on that? Yeah. Yeah, for several months now, we have not been uh, able to, to sell uh, new SIMs in the market. And uh, I must say it's a quite impressive uh, than 7% growth, uh, not coming from new sales, but actually coming from growing uh, the relation or, or R2 with existing customers. Uh, so, so I'm pleased to see that. But now uh, we, ha we are allowed uh, to use all the recircled numbers, meaning that customers that churn out, we can take those numbers and we can start selling in the market again. So now we are back in, in, uh, in also in the sales channels. We uh, also have a very good dialogue, so it's a dialogue with the regulator in, in uh, Bangladesh now, ongoing, taking completely away the SIM ban. And I'm quite positive that that, that will happen relatively soon. But with the, uh, uh, the, also with, with the um, allowance of, uh, of using recircled uh, SIM cards, uh, I don't see uh, that we are really hindered now from participating in the new sales. So going forward, I'm, I'm not so worried about this. Yes, and then on the fiber, uh, we do see now that we are able to reposition ourselves following a more mature dynamic in the Norwegian market. Uh, there is changes in maybe the, the dynamics when it comes to churn, but these customers very often remain on our network as wholesale customers. So the net ads we report are, are the net ads to Telenor, but in our network as such, we remain a, a, a large portion of these customers. So it is in foc an area with constant focus, of course, uh, it's, more, uh, it's a more dynamic game now, and, and we believe we are constantly improving in how we position and play in that dynamic game. And then we also foresee, as we said, from, from the new fiber agreement that we will also invest going forward into this to capture new growth and also the opportunities as we see them. Next caller, please. Thanks. We will take the next question from Line Titus from Bank of America. The line is open now. Please go ahead. Hi, Jim. Um, good morning, and thanks a lot for taking my question. Just uh, one wider one on, on your free cash flow, and then a quick follow-up. Um, just, just on the free cash flow, could you maybe um, give us a little bit of, of color on the working capital trend, and um, given that there has been a bit of attention um, on this in the current environment, on, on supply chains, and how you uh, would accept, expect them to um, continue kind of to work out over the next couple of quarters 
And related to that, maybe on CapEx, given that there are a couple of headwinds on the cash flow for you at the moment, one option could be, of course, a more selective approach to, to capital investments going forward to preserve cash flows. And your recent private deal already went into that direction and you guide for lower CapEx and tendency in the medium term. But how would that look like for you in the short term? And do you think you could be more cautious on spending and where would you prioritize? And then maybe very, very quick um, follow-up just on the private deal. Um, could you give us any number, any quantification on what cash flow leakage we could expect from the minority stake build? Uh, when it comes to, to free cash flow and, and working capital, we saw that we, we had a, a somewhat of a headwind on, on the working capital in the, in the uh, first half of the year. We said we expected it to improve in the second half. We are neutral now, and we do expect a slight in, in improvement in the working capital in the fourth quarter. Uh, we don't see any kind of structural trends, but we do see periodization between quarters uh, relating to when the capex is paid, uh, and, and we see that as a particular element to, um, uh, with the third quarter last year versus the third quarter this year. And then, as you might recall, that uh, based on the accounting rules, uh, third quarter last year, we also had the cash generated in Myanmar included in our cash flow. So we don't see any, any large structural uh, changes in it, but uh, it's more a shifting between the quarters. Um, when it comes to CapEx, uh, we are continuously maneuvering in where to, to most efficiently apply uh, the CapEx funds. We are in a situation now, as, as you also allude to, that we are investing uh, in fiber and will continue to invest in fiber. And then we also have, as we talked about on the CMD, we have 5G rollout in four markets in the Nordics. And, and it is, of course, important for us to, to be able to compete in those markets. But in the midst of this, we are constantly looking at how to best deploy the funds we have. Uh, and then what was the question on fiber the again? Leakage. The uh, leakage. Mm. Yeah, we have not been, uh, been uh, clear on that, uh, that nominal amount. We will come back to that when we, we have the share buyback and we believe that will be the mechanism for how to, to, to neutralize the leakage. And then we have said that approximately 30% of, of the proceeds that we get will be used uh, for share buybacks. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. We will take the next question from Line Osman from Berenberg. The line is open now. Please go ahead. Hello, thank you. Um, just two questions, please. Um, uh, the first question was on the fiber core. Um, can you indicate what, uh, you know, what kind of leverage you anticipate will be uh, put on uh, the fiber core, please? And also, um, you know, what is the kind of EBITDA growth rate that you're seeing um, at the fiber core at the moment? So that, that was the first question. Um, uh, the second question was for Sigve. Um, Sigve, amongst the remedies that you've highlighted, you needed more clarification on. I'm surprised that um, you know, you didn't mention that. I mean, in the notification, it says that the number of cell sites that the merged entity um, uh, has cannot be reduced uh, going forward. Um, and I was just wondering. I mean, you know, does that have any impact on your ability to? Um, you know, consolidate the network or decommission sites, which obviously will be a big portion of the synergy extraction. Thank you. Yeah, I can start with the second, and then you can think about the first. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I mentioned two examples, and but there are uh, more uh, issues here that we need clarification on, and you are mentioning now uh, one of those. Uh, and, and in the notification, it also says that uh, we have an obligation when it comes to population coverage. Uh, and, of course, the, that, that is natural that the regulator have a view on that. Uh, and that, that is what we are going to focus on. Uh, and I think we are almost there uh, when we are merging these two entities with the 5G presence that, that our future partner, True, has in Thailand already. And th that is w the main objective, I guess, that the regulator want to make sure that uh, we are 
are giving the people of Thailand a good 5G coverage. And then uh, it, the area you, you mentioned, uh, in my view, that, 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 uh, yeah, that, that's something we need to clarify because it doesn't really make sense uh, that, that you have parallel networks. So, so it's just an example of unclarity in, in the notification. Yes, and then on, on the Fiberco, uh, it's, uh, as we said, they, they are valuing the company on an EV basis of, of 36 billion kroner. And they will, the minority investor will pay 10.8 billion for that. The company as such will be a consolidated part of Telenor. So, uh, so that will be part of our normal uh, leverage, so to speak. Uh, it will, we will get the funds in and then we will uh, continue to invest. So it's not the traditional uh, structure or it's not a separate structure as such. It's part of us. We get paid for the EV and then there is, of course, a leverage uh, on the top co level for, for the investor. But that is not, uh, that will not impact the fiber co in, in, uh, as it is included in Telnor. Mm -hmm. And, and so just on the EBITDA growth that uh, you're seeing at the fiber co at the moment? Yeah, we have not uh, communicated on that. We are, uh, in, we are in a growth phase uh, where we are rolling out more and where we are fighting in the market, so, but we have not given any growth rates or indication on that. Thank you. Thank you. We will take the next question from the line. Adam from HSBC. The line is open now. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I had two, please. So firstly, on Pakistan uh, and the impact of the floods, I think maybe it's um, somewhat out of our minds because it's out of the press. But if you could give us an update on exactly the impact that you've seen in, in Q3, kind of how much that's ongoing into Q4 and any impact um, that you're anticipating further out in terms of both OPEX and maybe CAPEX to, um, to sort the network out to the degree that it needed to. And then secondly, um, there's a couple of mentions within the release of your operating activity stepping up. I think in your prepared comments, you mentioned Sweden and Bangladesh, as you had before. I guess I wonder how you feel about the kind of run rate of those businesses at the minute um, and whether or not you think there's kind of a further uptick to go, whether it's just very dependent on how you compete in those markets going forward or whether you're, uh, you know, all else equal operating uh, kind of as you would like to in those on that OPEX line. Thank you. Yes. So when it comes to the flooding in, in uh, Pakistan, that is, of course, uh, detrimental to the people of Pakistan. It is also impacting us when a high number of sites are down. Uh, it is, uh, we believe that this is partly, uh, or it is partly reflected in the numbers we see this quarter. It's a bit too early to give any kind of clear indication for the longer term impacts on this. But in the quarter as such, uh, the main reason for the OPEX increases continue to be energy and FX. So we don't see a material impact uh, this quarter. And it's, of course, something where we are constantly maneuvering uh, our local team in Pakistan and alongside a very demanding energy environment in general. So, uh, so it's, it's a maneuvering uh, that is going on, but it's not to the same extent impacting our numbers uh, this quarter. When it comes to, to uh, investments in the markets in, in Bangladesh and Sweden, uh, in Bangladesh we show, as you see, a 7% growth. It is with this growth level you continue to invest and it's profitable. We have the 5% the EBITDA. And in Sweden, we are continuing to evaluate our approach in the market. And, and uh, we also are, are working on how to, to best compete in the market. And that is evaluated going forward. So far, as you see, and as we have said, we see uh, the growth is coming through to the EBITDA. And, and that will be the ambition when we deploy and allocate sales and marketing funds also going forward. But these have been the two markets where we have said we have special attention and we see in the financial that is coming through to EBITDA. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We will take the next question from line Andrej from UBS. The line is open now. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I had two two questions, maybe both follow-ups. Uh, one on Thailand. Uh, so the question is, 
to what extent is the 2025 free cash flow dividend cover uh, target relying on synergy from Thailand, i.e. if you had you know, three years of uh, restrictions in terms of, for example, uh, network um, merger between the two companies, does that actually hinder that target or, or, or is that a small part of the overall uh, growth from here in and, and 2025? Because I believe if I look at the slides from the capital markets, they, the majority is still coming from from the Nordic. So so what kind of you know problems was the dividend cover would that be uh, in 2025? And then... Uh, Going back to energy, um, if you if you take everything that you know today, um, all the kind of uh, moving pieces, you've got some positive ones, such as the copper shutdown, uh, some, some negative ones, of course, going into 2023. Then if we look at the two and a half billion uh, amount that you're you're expecting uh, in, in, in the second half of 2022, is that you think that the kind of run rate roughly, uh, is, is that the peak on, on a semi-annual basis before some of the PPAs kick in, as you say, towards the end of 2023. Thank you. Yes. Um, so what we said when it comes to Thailand and the synergies, we are reporting a significant uh, NPV number of the synergies. But it is, of course, a long-term value creation plan. And also, as we said, we believe that the first years will also be years where you invest and adjust so there will not be a material impact on the cash flow from uh, the Thailand uh, merger in, in the early part uh, of the next three-year period. So it will not, over time, over the three years, we don't see a material impact if there is a, a delay or adjustment to this. So it will not materially impact the overall plan. Um, when it comes to energy for 2023, uh, what we see is, uh, and particularly, of course, looking at the Norwegian market where, where the main exposure is, as you know, uh, we see still a forecast of increasing energy prices into 2023. So, so really what will be the effect in, in uh, 2023 will depend on, on uh, the prices in the market uh, as, as we enter 2023. And as we see now in Norway, there is a small dip in the pricing but the forecasts uh, still remain fairly high. So, so it, is, it is difficult to, to say, and I don't want to guide into 2023 on, on, until I have to and until we will make that overall assessment, but there is still a view that the winter will require higher energy, um, that the energy prices will be higher during the winter in, in Europe in general as we see it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will take the next question from line Sarah Ang from JP Morgan. The line is open. Hi, thank you. Um, I had two questions, please. So you said before that you're a bit more careful on the lower end of the market with price increases. So I'm just curious to know what, what is your approach there um, or what is the thinking around there? Like, are you maybe um, giving more discounts because you're more cautious of the cost of living crisis or is it just not putting in price increases as much? Um, and, and the second question is, is there any scope for, you know, governmental intervention in the energy markets for corporates in any of your countries? Um, is that is that any potential upside to the energy cost um, expectations? Yeah, thank you. No, I think on the first question, I, I just said that, of course, the, the 30% of the mobile market in Norway, it's what we defined as a more price-sensitive segment. Uh, and that segment uh, we are addressing differently than we do with the 70% of the, the, more, uh, also the rest of the, the mobile market. So I don't think I want to go – and we are doing a price uh, adjustment also in that segment. So I don't think I want to go more into details on, on what we do, uh, but uh, yeah, that's the way we look at it. Yes, and, and uh, on your question on energy, uh, as we talked about before in Asia, several of the markets we are in Asia have regulated prices. So, uh, so there is some kind of intervention already in those markets, and that is why, of course, you only see the large increase in, in Pakistan, because there are other pricing dynamics in the other countries in, in Asia. Um, and then in the Nordics, of course, we we follow the general debate, uh, and uh, and we are acting as uh, as uh, we 
we cover our uh, consumption based on the, the the mechanism as we have. We say in, in Sweden we are hedging. Finland, we have the rolling, uh, the kind of the yearly rolling, and then we have uh, the exposure to the market, as you allude to, in Norway and Denmark until the PPAs come into place. I think we have one caller left, uh, Tone. It appears so. Yeah. Or maybe not. If there Thank you. We will take the next question. Sure, we'll take one final question from the line. Frank from the end. The line is open now. Please go ahead. Yes, hi. Just a follow-up question, if I may, on, on then the Thailand process going forward with regards to uh, the discussions with uh, the regulator there on these clarification items you have. You know, what can you give us some uh, idea, or if, if you have one, <laughs> on on, on, on what the formal and um, you know at least the formal process is, uh, if not the informal one, but but at least the formal process on you know how these discussions are likely to to go, the time span you expect, and um, and so on. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question, Frank. Uh, I, I I actually don't know the answer to that question. Uh, so uh, we received this notification letter just a couple of days ago. And we are going through it now uh, and to understand it uh, and, and the next steps and, and how this is going to um, seek out for clarifications. Uh, I don't know how long time and, and exactly how that, that process is going to, uh, to play out. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. There's no further question. Thank you, everyone, for listening in and asking questions, and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.